Thank you for joining another episode of the Ketonian Corner. I am Jolene Hale, and I'm here with my co-host, John Davidson. Hello, John. Hello, hello. How are you? It's been a couple of weeks since we have got together. Um, some vacations. We're in December, so we've got holidays, holidays and everything coming. Um, so today, we are interviewing Kristen Rowell. Um, this is a person that we had met during KetoCon, and um, she is very big in the fitness world. So, John, you want to give a little bit um, on how we how we came to this interview? And yeah, I just you know we had talked. I don't know. So I guess we tried to put something together as much as two uh, two months ago, but we've all been so busy. We finally uh, kind of connected with right here at the New Year's. So although there's a a ton of topics we could talk about today. Uh, I want to try to kind of make some actionable steps revolving around getting started at the gym. And the reason why I think uh, you're so qualified to talk about that is you went from, uh, you know, multiple years in the gym to be even, even uh, competing in fitness world, right? So why don't you start by just giving us yeah. a little bit about your backstory and and that kind of uh, trail down, uh, I guess, your origin story, for lack of a better term. Sure. I'd be happy to. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about the topic and I'll try to really stay focused on it because I agree I could, I could go on about this for hours. So I'll be, I'll be brief in this answer and then ask me any follow-up questions you want. Perfect. I have, I have worked out, kind of been a fitness enthusiast really my whole life, but what happened for me by way of taking it, what I'll call sort of the next level, was I graduated from law school in 2003 and I started practicing and when I was in law school and before you know law school you don't have a ton of time but you certainly have more time as a student than you do once you become a professional and what I realized is I'm not going to have time anymore once I start my law practice to do an hour of cardio a day lift all these weights spend two hours in the gym I just was worried that I'd lose some of my fitness, and a friend of mine, we were on a run one day, and she said, have you ever heard of this gym? It's called Discover Strength. And I said, I haven't. And she said, well, you're not going to believe this, but you can work out there for 30 minutes twice a week, and that's all they require of you. And it's really intense, and it seems like it'd be right up your alley because I'm a pretty intense person. So I said, whatever, I'll try it. So I worked out there for the first time. It literally was only 30 minutes, and during that 30 minutes, you're working with machines and lifting heavy. It was heavier than I had ever lifted, but you're working with a trainer who's taking you through these exercises, and within four or six workouts, I was only going once a week at the time, I started to notice my body really change, and I started to get a lot more lean muscle tissue, and I started to feel a lot stronger, and so I've never looked back. I've been working out there since November of 2007. It's been 10 years. So, just if you could step back just a little bit to make sure I can kind of understand this, you went from going how much, like how much uh, when you were like an enthusiast, I mean, before you started the switch, were you going to the gym like five times a week or? Yeah, it was definitely five times a week, but it was, it was the number of hours. So I was determined to do an hour of cardio a day because in wow. my mind, that's what I thought was required. And then on top of that, I would do a, I would do upper body on Monday, lower body on Tuesday, upper body on Wednesday, lower body on Thursday. So it was another hour of lifting on top of it. And what I know now is I was just pretty inefficient. You can be right. a lot more efficient at the gym lifting if you get in, get out, and work intensely. And so I'd say the two main changes for me were being really efficient while I'm there about my lifting, and then the intensity of my lifting is is much stronger than it ever was. So when you say intensity, are you talking like hit principles or are you doing more like speed work um, on the lifting heavy or, or where's the intensity fit into that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So what I've learned over the course of my time working out there and talking with the trainers, they're very research-based and science-based. So everything is evidence-based training. And what the evidence shows us is if you want to make your muscles stronger, you have to break down those muscle fibers to the point that you actually get into what's called momentary muscle failure. So an exercise is only going to benefit you from a strengthening standpoint 
if you get to the point that you actually are about to drop the weight. So, of course, from a safety perspective, you want someone with you if you're going to get to that point. So I'll give you an example. If I'm doing a chest press, and again, I work mostly with medics and Nautilus equipment. I'm not throwing free weights around hardly ever. But if I'm pushing out on a chest press and I'm doing the motion of pushing out, I'm counting out for two and I'm counting back for four seconds. So it's very controlled and deliberate. And when I get to the point that I can no longer push it out and I'm really, really trying to do it, they might give me a little bit of assistance to get to the end. But then I can probably, because you're, you're, I always get them confused, eccentric or concentric. I think you're concentric is when you come back. You're typically stronger on the negative, on the coming back. So I may be able to push out three more exercises, which is really going to strengthen my chest muscles with their assistance of helping me. So that's what I mean by intensity. Is on I'm the way down. Myself you hard. Yes, you, exactly. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. And on, the, yes. and on the way out, but it's, I could never do that on my own because I need their, their help to get through those last couple of inches and then I can still do the down. So, the, so in other words, it works because I can do more reps than I would otherwise on my own. So it's really intense. I mean, I'm very fatigued from a muscle development standpoint for the two days after these workouts. They do not let you come back to their gym for 72 hours after you've lifted. Because the research shows after you exercise in a really intense weightlifting session, you are your weakest approximately 48 hours later. So that's the worst time to go back to the gym and lift those same muscles. You're your strongest about 72 hours later. So that would be the best time to go back. So you mentioned the name of the gym. Um, is, is that a, a local place? Is that something that's national? I've, I've never heard of it, but not that big of a gym. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is a local place. Um, it's here in Minneapolis where I live. They do have some partnership gyms in other locations that have the similar philosophy. So if there's ever a time where I'm traveling and I can't get my two workouts in a week at Discover Strength, I will send an email to my trainers and say, hey, this is the area I'm going to be in. What are the gyms? So, for example, when in February I was in L.A. and I needed a workout, and so the owner of Discover Strength in Minneapolis said, try these two different places and see if you can get in. One was called Super Slow L.A., and another was called Pure Strength L.A., and I was able to get into Pure Strength, and I had a fantastic workout. 20 minutes, really intense, and exactly what I needed. There's a place in Chicago called Hard Pressed. They have a similar um, philosophy, I'll call it, with respect to lifting, which is evidence-based, strength-based training. And so I know that that's another location. But, you know, I think that this platform, certainly there's a business model to be made to be more national. And so that, that may be in the future. We will see. Yeah, and just just to kind of see if I can follow on. I read a book. Uh, it's by by science. Uh, Doug McGruff. Is that the kind of I don't know if you're familiar with that. Is that the kind of evidence based um, training you're talking about? It is. I'm familiar with the book, and it is. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So that's the right, other. So thing. I am I mean, following. It, you don't have. Yeah. So you don't have to be at this gym to do it. I mean, I would say to me, and this is something to think about for men and women going into the new year. I know that a lot of people have goals in their mind to start an exercise plan once the year starts and how am I going to get my, how am I going to meet my goals and how am I going to be able to do it and stick to it and not fall off the wagon at the end of January. And to me, there's a couple different ways to do that. The number one way I think that people can commit to their goals and stick to them is accountability. So for me, it's all about working with a trainer. And trainers come at varying prices and varying skill levels and varying degrees. But if you can find a trainer in your area and hire that person even to work with once a week and to communicate to that person, look, what I want to do while I'm here is I want to be efficient. I'm sure you're a great person, but I'm not interested in having a bunch of coffee talk. I want to be here. I want to work out for 30 minutes and I want to get out. And I want you to push me lifting beyond the point that I would normally be pushed. And if you have those appointments to meet with your trainer, You're not going to let that person down. The number of times I have wanted to hit the snooze button, but I can't because I have an appointment with my trainer and it makes me get to the gym and get there. To me, that's a really, really invaluable thing that I don't think enough people realize psychologically will help you reach your goals. And then the other thing, and I don't think I'm telling anyone anything they don't know, is to write it down. You know, 
by this date in 2018, I will have lost X percent body fat, or I will have been able to do 10 push-ups instead of five, or whatever it is, but write it down because they, the, also research shows when you write down your goals, you are much, much, much more likely to achieve them. And I really like the way you worded those goals. You didn't say, I want to lose five pounds. You said, I want to lose yeah. X percent body fat. And I, and I think that if you think about the goal as a, you know, making it achievable and then having kind of a definition like you just said, all of those goals were were, were great examples uh, of some goals. So um, yeah. from the from switching gears just a little bit, and I know I'm sure. trying to keep us around uh, – staying at the gym, but you mentioned that you used to do an hour of cardio a day and now you've backed off. And uh, one of yep. the things that I kind of warned you to stay away from is uh, <laughs> the running piece. And, and <laughs> but just to, to kind of, to let me take us off track, uh, how did sure. you then gear down your, your running uh, to, to work with this model? Or do you even practice cardio um, in this model? So I do practice cardio in this model and, you know, I go through cycles with it, John. So I, I still am a runner. I still consider myself a runner. In fact, I ran two marathons earlier this year, earlier this fall, but since those now I'm not running very much at all and I'm cross training with other forms of cardio. So I do an arc trainer, which is sort of what you think of like an elliptical machine. But again, I make an appointment to do the arc trainer at a gym, I have a couple gym memberships, I'm going to be honest, um, where there's a coach kind of teaching 16, 17, sometimes 12, sometimes five people through a class. So again, it's mm -hmm. that accountability piece. I also have some girlfriends that I run with that will come over to my house and we go run early in the morning outside. I live by a chain of lakes. So I do still incorporate cardio just because it makes me feel really good. I really enjoy it. But in this model, you do not need to be hyper-focused on cardio. So I, this morning, for example, my cardio was, I went to my gym, Discover Strength, and they do have a treadmill at one of their locations where they'll put you through a HIIT workout on a treadmill. So I did 30 minutes. It was a little over three miles, three and a half miles, but I did a five minute warm up, and then I did two minutes at 9.0 miles per hour. And Which then for, I did three for minutes. Rel for relevance, that's like pretty much a sprint. Exactly. It was pretty fast. Yep. But then I did three yep. minutes of just a jog. And then I did another two minutes of fast. But this one was on a little bit of an incline. Three minutes of a jog. So the point is there were five sets. But I only did five two-minute bursts. Yes. And the efficiency in that HIT exercise. Now, I say HIT because that's a buzzword and it's high-intensity training. And it's really valuable. But I think it's also important to caution people, you really shouldn't be doing HIT every day. I mean, so that's the only HIIT cardio exercise I'm doing this week is right. that one 30-minute exercise on the treadmill and then two separate strength training workouts, but that's it. My other stuff is an easy jog, a rest day, another rest day, some work on the ARC trainer. It's that quality over quantity that I'm huge about now, and who doesn't want more of that in their life because it makes us all have more time, which we're all searching for anyways. Yeah, yeah. Back in, uh, you know, like I think it's six months ago, we t I, I talked about my – uh, primal blueprint fitness kind of model and sprint once a week was one of the ones on there. And I, and I did mention that the hip model is a good way of getting that in. So where do you put that when you are talking about your lifting heavy days? I'm assuming that you don't do them. You could, you know, do you do it before, after do you make sure that you pad it a couple days? Um, so yeah, that's a great that question. Sprint so once a week. Yep. Great question. Unfortunately, because of my work life as an attorney, a lot of it depends on my schedule. But for example, this week I did a heavy lift on Monday morning and I did a heavy lift on Thursday night. So that was last night. This, today's Friday. And then I went to the gym and went on the treadmill this morning. Now I will tell you when I got up this morning, having lifted last night right after work, I was really tired and sore. And I thought, oh, this isn't ideal to be getting on the treadmill and having to pound out a sprint workout when I'm not recovered. But I tend to want to do my lifting before my running. So I'll even stack them sometimes where I'll go to the gym and I will do my half an hour of strength training and then I'll do my half an hour of cardio or vice versa. I'll switch them. So I you were to do the lifting before the cardio. Okay. I was, that's, you, you read my mind there. 
<laughs> yep. Yep. I prefer lifting before cardio and research also shows because you burn off the glycogen and any sugar that you've had, which of course I eat so little of anyways ever, but to the extent I have any of that stored, I'm going to burn that off during the lift and just continue to fat burn then during the run. Yeah. So that speaking of sugar, that brings us into a really good yeah. point. So nutrition wise, um, what are, how, how do you bring that into the overall, um, the health of your, your lifestyle? Yeah. So, um, nutrition is a big part of it for me, you guys. And here's the deal. I started lifting at this gym in 2007. I have consistently done body fat testing and analysis of myself at least twice a year, sometimes four times a year, um, ever since 2009. So the first two years I was working out there, I didn't, but there is, I do use a bod pod. That's that and DEXA scan apparently are the two kind of most accurate. And for me, the bod pod has been an invaluable tool in all of my nutrition. And the reason is this, it tells you what your resting metabolic rate is. So it allows you to figure out a way to set your calories for your activity and your body type, not the person who's sitting in the office next to you or who's your sister or your friend. I mean, I find it fascinating that there's all sorts of information online that says women should only have this many calories a day and men this many. It's like, based on what? Unless you yeah. know what your body fat percentage is and what your output is so that you have an understanding of where you're starting, you're really sort of making up numbers as you go. So I use that as a tool to set my calories on my fitness pal. And then I use that as a guideline every day and I track my macros every day in large part because I want to make sure I'm getting enough fat and protein in my diet. And then I'm always keeping my carbs low because I eat ketogenic. So for me, because I have such so much lean muscle tissue, my resting metabolic rate is about 1325, which means if I didn't do anything during the day and I just laid in bed, I didn't get up, I didn't brush my teeth, I didn't move, I didn't blink, I would burn 1,325 calories. So when I research and hear women say, well, I'm going to go on a diet, so I'm going to set my calories at 1,200, I think, okay, well, I would die or my met metabolism would crash and plummet and it would go into starvation mode and I'd start to lose all this muscle tissue that I've worked so hard for. So I set my calories at 1,900. And then I have set a ratio where I'm 5% carbs, 20% protein, and 70% fat. So on my fitness pal, I'm typically eating my body weight in fat grams each day, a little less than my body weight in protein, and then I try to do less than 25 carbs per day. And you've been doing Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, that's so fantastic. I've been doing that. What? It, yeah, good question. I, what I've been doing is I've, I've vacillated with it. So when I did my first bodybuilding competition in April of this year, I hired a nutritionist who had me on a really high protein diet and I got to give it to her. It worked for me. I dropped body fat. I had gotten pretty high as, in January of this year for, you know, I wasn't tracking. It was the holidays. I just wasn't being very careful. I'm human like everyone else. So I go up and down. And so my body fat percentage had gotten to a high. It was just about at 20, which I'd never been that high in all of the 10 years that I've tested. So I thought, oh my gosh, if I'm going to do this competition, I've got to get my stuff together. And I hired this woman. She had me on 200 grams of protein a day, which of course I was, as a keto person, was worried about gluconeogenesis. But because I think of all the lean muscle tissue I have, for whatever reason, it worked for my body. And I also incorporated more fat and really kept my carbs down. But she had me doing a one-day carb refeed. Um, so the short answer to your question is, I've, I've been doing this sort of eating for approximately three years on and off with some variation. Awesome. So Yeah, I, going back to 2014, I had, and I won't go into this whole story, but it all started after I had a serious fall on a work trip on ice where I broke my right leg in 10 places. and that was a huge, huge, scary thing for me to go through. I had never broken a bone in my body, and I was a big marathon runner, and I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? If I can't do all this running, I'm going to gain all this weight. My fitness is going to go out the window. And, in fact, what it did is that it actually was an opportunity for me to figure out how to get fitter, and it's what started my ketogenic journey. 
Wow. I, I totally want to get take us down a side path on muscle <laughs> sure. atro- atrophy, but I won't. <laughs> oh, okay, I could okay, tell you about my chicken calf uh, for hours. It was so oh, fun I mean, to I work can back. Imagine, uh, right? You probably had yeah. to then overcompensate by lifting on one leg. Okay, so instead of I taking did. us down I that did. complete I did. rabbit hole, yep. I'll, I'll try another to pull show. us back in. Another show. And, uh, Another show. I think we're going to have two shows now, uh, <laughs> yes, just off our conversation perfect. so far. Uh, but circ- circling back to, um, I, I am not very good at tracking my macros, but what I am okay. good about is realizing when stress is impacting and I need to maybe gear down my fitness because I am, you know, I am hyper stressed at work, something like that. Uh, I can only imagine yeah. being a, a trial lawyer and doing what you're uh-huh. doing how that stress must really impact your overall health. So how do you kind of take yep. that into consideration? Do you have a slider for that in my <laughs> fitness pal? <laughs> I'll give you my recent example. I just had a really lengthy and intense trial in November. Um, I had more hours of time that I build in November than I have in a really long time. It was a very intense month. And I refer to it as I tell people, I said, the one thing that I was determined to do during that month is to keep my diet on point. And so I called it my trial diet. I said the trial diet was locked and loaded. And of course, as you guys know, because of being ketogenic, it was critical to me to have really high and solid brain function the whole month. I needed it. More than ever, my diet had to be on point in those times of stress. So I actually used my fitness pal religiously during trial. You know, I would log something quick in the morning. I've got it on my phone. It's an app. But I would, on our mid-morning breaks, over the lunch hour and our afternoon breaks, I made sure that I was even better about my diet. There were a couple days where with the food that we brought in for clients and experts, you know, I had a cookie one day because I just felt like I wanted it. (laughs) So it wasn't without some deviation, trust me. But to me, the points of stress, it's like that's one thing that I really can control that'll help me get me through it. And that's why I actually rely on my fitness pal even more. So how did you get that mindset? Because I think the standard person listening to this is probably like, oh, man, stress is when I say screw it and have five cookies. Yes, and I hear you. For me, here's how. Here's really what, what made me switch is trying it. It was the experiment of, okay, first day of trial, I'm going to intermittent fast until lunch. I'm not eating anything. I'm going to drink my exogenous ketones, and I'm going to wait until I get to lunch. And I felt so good by the time lunch hit, that I thought, okay, I got to make sure I'm really strict keto right now at lunch. And so I was logging my macros, making sure I had enough fat. I didn't want to be in a situation where I was in the middle of cross-examining an expert witness, and all of a sudden, I was going to have a blood sugar drop. There's nothing worse than a blood sugar drop feeling when you need to be on your A game. And so I thought, if I really want to perform, I'm going to try this in an experiment. And so it was the reinforcement of how good I felt that helped me keep going. So when you really, look at that I feel cookie, like that. Oops, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. Yeah. So when you looked at that nope, cookie, you were thinking fine. you were thinking mental clarity. I need mental clarity. I'm not going to have that. So you basically associated that strictness to how your your performance was going to be in the courtroom. Yeah, and you know what else I'll do is because it's like I trust me, I love cookies. I could eat my body weight in cookies every day if I was left to my own devices, but I choose not to. So what I do is figure out ways that I can satiate that physiological sweet craving with something else. So, you know, there's all sorts of products on the market now for ketogenic sweet cravings. And I have way less of them than I ever did in my life before I was keto. But if I, if everyone else on my trial team is eating a cookie, I'll have, I'm giving you an example because I know I did this during trial. I'll have a net two carb, little Atkins, Atkins, like old school Atkins, caramel mm-hmm. chew bar because it's got two net carbs and it'll make me feel like I'm part of the sweets team. Right. Yeah, I'll do little gotcha. things like that, that at least will just um, make me feel like I'm still like, I'm not totally depriving myself so that I can still have something that'll make me feel good and satisfy the craving. Fantastic. Well, um, we kind of got a little deep. So um, if we were going to pull it sure. back just a little bit, um, obviously, we talked about some quite a, a tense. Uh, sorry, we talked about a lot of intensity. If you were, if you just had somebody walk up to you at, the, at right after court, and they came up to you and they were like, "Hey, 
you, I want some advice. Where do you think I should start? What, what would you tell them then? And when you say advice, John, are you talking with respect to fitness, diet, or both? Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's, stay, let's stick with fitness. Um, I, I think we've okay. talked enough about this podcast on diet. We've got some pretty good intros there. So let's st- let's stick with fitness on this. Okay. Okay. So for fitness, I'd say my number one piece of advice would be to find a local gym or a personal at home personal trainer, someone that you can hire and work with that'll keep you accountable. And I hear people say often, if they're looking for an excuse, well, it's too expensive or, you know, there's no one right near me. There's someone that will help you reach your goals that you can afford if you cut out some other stuff. I'm not saying you have to get the Cadillac of gym memberships and spend all kinds of money, but I think having someone who will keep you accountable that's a professional that you can say, I really want to work intensely, that would be my number one recommendation. And what goes along with that is that it really is all about strength training. If you can only do one exercise a week, if you can only work out once a week, throw the cardio out the window and lift weights. I call strength training my anti-aging serum. It really is. I just did my body fat test this morning and I'm 41 years old and I'm the lowest I've ever been in my life. I have the most lean muscle tissue I've ever had in my life. And I laugh with the owner of the gym. I said, I'm kind of like a fine wine. I keep aging. I keep getting better with age. And he laughed and said, you know, it's just so impressive. And I said, but it's this place. And I, granted, it's the diet choices and it's a lot. But it, it, the strength training is critical. So that would be my one piece of advice. Kind of a longer answer probably, but that's it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it sounds like that you have a pretty good handle on all of this. You've been doing fitness and nutrition sounds like for a a really long time. What are some of the challenges that you have encountered and how, how do you address those and, um, overcome those day-to-day challenges? Yeah, great question. So I'd say the challenges that I encounter range from really, really small to more significant, by really, really small, I'll give you a funny example. Outside of my office, one of the secretaries who sits right outside there, she has a candy dish that is full of M&Ms, Snickers, blah, 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 all day, every day. Like five days a week when I'm in this office, I have to walk by that to go to the women's restroom. (laughs) And so the willpower of never digging in that candy dish, and every once in a while I do, but the willpower of that is a small example. But what I've realized over time, especially with eating keto, that so, I think is so important for people to understand is I mean this very truly, eating ketogenic changes the biochemistry in your brain so that you really don't crave it. If I was to start and have two handfuls of those M&Ms, I promise you, I will crave it all day long. And it's not because, oh, well, I just had 10, I might as well have the whole bag. It's because it actually changes your brain. Your dopamine receptors in your brain light up, and just like if you have one drink you want to, or just like someone who's a drug addict takes a hit of something and they want more, the same is true for sugar. So if I don't start, then I don't go down that path, but the not starting is because I try to keep my diet clean so that my biochemistry doesn't crave it in the first place. I never actually thought that was possible. I mean, when I trained for marathons, right during law school, after law school, I used to do the pasta dinner the night before, think that I had to have all these carbs. And at the time I would suffer from all sorts of digestion issues and, and problems that I could not pinpoint what it was from. I don't have any of that anymore. So I gave you that small example. And then I'd say for a a bigger example, especially because of my career, um, I entertain a lot. I'm really social. I'm a foodie. I love going to nice restaurants. So it's, it's really making good choices when I'm at restaurants. You know, not all of my girlfriends in my friend group eat the same way I do. In fact, very few of them do. So when they order French fries for the table, every once in a while I'll have one or two, but I just try to focus on how it makes me feel and how good I feel. Not because I was strong enough to overcome eating the French fry. It's not about that. It's literally about how my mental clarity feels, how I'll feel when I wake up the next day, how my stomach feels. It's those kinds of things. Yeah, keeping the end in mind. Uh, I like it. Yes. So, so yep. going back to uh, you know, when you were fir- first 
kind of talking down that path. Um, how long did it take you to kind of, I'm going to call it kick the sugar and be fat adapted? Because for me personally, it took me, uh, mm. and to be fair, I wasn't very, very strict keto in the beginning. I kind of fell into keto accidentally, which is a whole nother conversation in general. But, uh, yep. it took me a solid two years before I could walk by those donuts and not be like, Ooh, I totally want one of those. About how long did it take you? Yeah. Oh gosh. That's a good question because I really wish that I had like written a daily diary of how I felt every day when I started this. Cause <laughs> I wish I could remember. <laughs> I got no idea. Yeah, uh, I know. I will tell though. you, it took me a while too. It took me a while too. I mean, if I had to put a number on it, I guess that it was at least a year. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing because it's not like I felt like it was some strong pull and I was fighting it all the time. But I all of a sudden remember, and I can tell you about going into my office in the kitchen, they order donuts every Friday. I can tell you when I remember going in there and not being affected by the fact that all the donuts were there. It was like, oh, that's interesting. Those are donuts. And I love donuts, you guys. My 30th birthday, my girlfriends made a tower of Dunkin' Donuts instead of a cake because I love donuts that much. (laughs) And now I can see them and, and not be like, I literally have to have that. I mean, it used to be a strong pull for me, and it's just not there anymore. It's really not. Oh yeah, me is the the uh, the uh, rolls at Texas Roadhouse. I don't know if you have them uh, where you're where you're at, but I I look at those and I'm like for a long time I was like oh I could just eat seven baskets of those. But right? you're right. You hit, you hit a point where you're like eh. Now you look at it and you think oh man if I do that you think about how you're gonna feel tomorrow and it's just you're kind of yeah. Just like, yeah. So well, and I'm thinking for example, so like when I went out yeah. to a lunch yesterday, so I I had a business lunch yesterday. And people probably think I'm nuts with how I order, but I just do it. I don't care. I ordered the burger on the menu. So it's a white cheddar burger. I got, I just said, I just want the burger with the cheese and the lettuce, onion, and tomato. I don't want the bun. I don't want the fries. And then I want a side of four half deviled eggs. And that was my lunch. And by the way, it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I, on occasion, I order two two meals. <laughs> I'll take this and this, <laughs> right. and then you can keep all the pasta. I don't care. Uh, right, but, exactly. So, I mean, so, I remember yeah. I was with one of my girlfriend's daughters. We were doing a shopping thing for the holidays a couple weekends ago, and I ordered my, bre- my brunch at this restaurant. And then I said, but don't bring the hash browns. And so then this 10-year-old looks at me, and she's like, you don't want your hash browns? I said, no, honey, I just don't eat them. I don't really like them. But she was just flabbergasted. And so we all kind of laugh because my girlfriends know how I eat. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like you're pretty self-confident because that that's another challenge is being able to order what you want when you get there uh, can be a yep. challenge if you're, so, especially in a social setting like you're talking about. So um, yep. just to kind of reel us back in, I know we're, we're we're kind of getting a little bit shorter on time. I want to make sure, is there anything that we kind of left out that you wanted to mention or, or uh, kind of, or kind of bring back up? You know, one of the things that um, I think I just add to our discussion, and I know that we've talked a lot about the diet stuff already, but um, to the extent that people are interested in really kind of embarking on this new fitness endeavor where they're going to at least try strength training and they haven't done it before. I would encourage people to think about also really, at least if they're not going to write everything down, at least just making sure they get enough protein in their diet. So with ketogenic, you know, it's a higher fat diet, of course, and that's what what I focus on. But when you're building muscle, it is really important to have enough protein. So there's a lot of different statistics on what the ratios are, but especially if you get done with a really tough strength training exercise um, session, it's important to get that protein within some of the research shows as as quickly as 20 minutes. So that's one time where even if I'm intermittent fasting, I will have my protein right after I lift just so that I get the best benefit from my exercise. Do you think that's an advanced thing or more um, like uh, if if I was a beginner and they were just starting, would, would you agree with that? Or is that more, you know, inking the last percentage out in your mind? Um, no, I think that's for beginners too. I think that's yeah. for everyone. Yeah. I think protein for strength training is important. And, you know, there are people who are running a diff- lot of different tests who might disagree about it. I actually, for my next bodybuilding competition, I'm hiring Robert Sykes, 
who is oh. a keto con who spoke at keto con. Yeah, yeah. So he's yeah, going to train me in a different way, and I'm excited to see how different it is from last year. I'm not going to do any carb refeeds. I just I don't like the way I feel when I do those, so I'm not going to do them. And he's going to have my diet dialed in, so it'll be fun. Oh man, now we got three topics to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I have a feeling you're going to be a reoccurring guest. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm happy to. Well, so what? Great. Uh, yeah, and just be- before we, we we go, kind of just around that. Sure. Um, you said that you you feel bad um, on the refeeds. Can you go in just a yeah. little bit more detail? Because I know that it's very common that people talk about cheat meals or carb refeeds or you know, depending on who it is, the, the methodology, a carve up or whatever you want to call it. You say you feel like you don't feel good. What, what, how do you feel when you do that? Sure. Yep. Um, happy to answer that. It's really two things. What I noticed because I was doing one day of a carb refeed each week for the six weeks leading up to this bodybuilding show. One, I felt pretty tired, which are you there? Ooh, I yep. lost you. Sorry. I think my headset just fried out on me. There we go. So one of the things was um, that I felt tired, and I have to imagine it's because of the high and low with the blood sugar all day. It just kind of exhausts my body. So that was one thing. And then, you know, I just experience a lot more GI and stomach cramping problems when I'm eating carbs. And I think my body just doesn't really like them. It doesn't want to process them, and it just enjoys processing protein and fat better. So those are the two things for me. Yeah, and your headset doesn't like it either, it seems. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It, it was saying low battery to me right when we started, and I thought, oh, this is going to leave a mark. But, you know, <laughs> hey, I, I can charge it. Roll the dice. Roll the dice. <laughs> exactly. I said I was going to exactly. take you too long. I said I was running long. So it's my fault. <laughs> no, we're all fine. Right. I'm fine on time. I'm okay. That's all right. Well, reel us back in, Jolene. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, what's next for you, Kristen? I know that when we talked before that you had some really big ideas, and we'd love to hear about all that, too. Great. Thank you, Jolene. So a couple things. One is I'm going to, in pretty short order, start training for this next bodybuilding competition in spring. So Robert and I will begin working together in January. So I'm excited about what will happen for me over that probably four-month or so period we'll have together. And then also because I am so passionate about this fitness and diet stuff that I've been so involved in for so many years, I'm working on starting my own podcast so that I can speak about that, those topics and also interview other people and hopefully provide inspiration to people who are interested in that. I, I get asked a lot of questions from acquaintances, strangers, friends, people I meet about my diet and exercise program. And I just, I'm excited to talk about it because what I do, I don't think is difficult. And it's taken me a lot to learn all of the things that I do, but it really isn't that hard of work if you just have the information. So I spend a lot of time listening to ketogenic podcasts. I spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks. I try to use my free time to educate myself about this stuff because I find it so fascinating. So those are the two kind of big things on the horizon. And then longer term, I'm going to run the Boston Marathon again in 2019. Impressive. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, The marathon, it was on my bucket list, and then I took it off after I did a half. I'm (laughs) like, I'm not going to handle this. Maybe maybe that'll be our next conversation. You can kind of talk me back into it, but... Perfect. So if, you're, if we're going to summarize some actionable takeaways, uh, we mentioned the book Body by Science, but really you're just you're just more saying I don't. It doesn't really matter. Just start, you know, try some weightlifting. It's it's uh, probably a good place to start. So I think that's a fantastic challenge. You talked about getting yep. a little bit more rest. You talked about getting uh, an accountability partner, even if it's just once a week, uh, some type of accountability buddy, and paying for it kind of levels that up. Writing and tracking goals, and then uh, what what I miss? I think you got the list. That sounds All great. Right. Sounds sounds yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that is the list. Well, we appreciate you having uh, uh you know having us to interview you, and uh, well, hopefully uh, soon we can have you back on. We'll talk about uh, one of the uh, four topics we <laughs> we kind of rabbit <laughs> hole on. And uh, I was going to say one of our other tangents. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, that or maybe we'll have to have them, it sounds like, on your podcast because that's a fantastic oh, challenge great. to throw out to you. So uh, you want to, you wanna, on the air, uh, give yourself a bold goal for uh, the entire public of when you're going to come out with that podcast? See oh, I love this there. question. This is awesome because, again, accountability is my number one thing. Ah, so I kind of picked I'm that gonna... up today. So uh, yeah. <laughs> It is. So I'm going to give March 31st for a launch date. I love it. End of Q1. So we look forward to that. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you so much, Kristen. Um, it's been a joy talking to you, and I'm sure that we will be talking to you again. And thank you to all the listeners. Um, go out to iTunes. Give us a review. We'd love to hear uh, comments and what you guys think about this so that we know if we need to change anything or if we're on track for you. So until next time, thank you.